And we're going to turn to Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> and we want to take a little look at the elder son. Um, Luke 15 and verse 25 and 26. By the way, if I look tired, I am. <laughs> I feel like I've been around the world. Scott and I were talking. I said, it seemed like I've been on planes for the last month. <clears throat> um, verse 25 and 26. Now, his elder son, so this is uh, speaking of the father. His elder son, his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. All right. So the elder son comes from laboring in the field. Um, sometimes we, we talk about being missionaries is going into the harvest field and ministering in the field <clears throat> clearly he was ministering if you if you will I'll say it like this for God <laughs> um, but when he got there he heard uh, music and he heard rejoicing going on in the house in the house dancing maybe that maybe he saw the father dancing yeah because, I mean, remember, this is about the unprodigal father. And um, so he heard this music, the elder son heard this music and this rejoicing in the house and possibly the father dancing, certainly dancing going on. But the, the merriment that is conveyed to us is of the father and the prodigal son. So I got a feeling that the father might have been out there just overjoyed. Um, happy hearts. And then the prodigal comes and he hears all of that. He's going, you know, what's going on? But he really didn't say what's going on. He said, what does this mean? Okay. Um, you know, a certain kind of people will go, you know, see something like that and go, hey, what's going on? Because they don't, you know, they just got there. I don't know. But there are certain people who everything has a meaning, and I'm not talking about necessarily in the Lord, just... I need to know what this means in relationship to me. <laughs> what, is, what does this mean? And how do I fit into this picture? Which it seems to lean that way because he's the one that's asking, you know, he's the one that's complaining about what is going on and that he feels left out. And... He turns in verse 26 and he called one of the servants. And he asked one of the, what does this mean? Okay, so he's looking at the servants as his counselors. You know, uh, if you want to know what's going on with the father, go locate the son. But if you don't, if you don't know what's going on, then there's a problem right there. Not not just going to other counselors, but um, and I wouldn't consider a servant a counselor. I mean, I would consider him someone who is on the outside of the house, who doesn't really know the family spirit, and in. This family, this family of, of God, 
the family spirit is one of the most important things. You know, I've always, I've talked about it, many of you have heard me talk about it before, but people are looking for the will of God. I want to know the will of God. And very early in my walk, the Lord began to deal with me that it's not just finding the will of God and go do it. He said, you know, there's a timing for the will of God. You trust in the timing as well as in what you've heard is his will. Because that timing, you can know the will of God and jump the timing and then you mess the whole thing up. So, and then number three is what spirit do you do the will of God in? And, you know, so many Christians just think, well, find out what the will of God is. And, you know, it's a little bit, don't you remember when uh, Israel was there and Moses went up into the mountain and, and it was lightning and all this stuff. And Moses came down and they said, look, just tell God, tell us what you want us to do and we'll do it. Just tell us what you want, you know. No consideration of a certain spirit because, you know, the scriptures say God is spirit. God is spirit. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, for me, that's a, that's a, um, a template. I run things through when I'm seeking the will of God is that I want to know all three. I want them to line up. I, I remember a story on my first trip to Ireland. And, um, and John had taken us out to uh, the edge of the, um, it was actually the Atlantic Ocean, basically, if I remember correctly. If not, it was the Irish Sea. But, it, but uh, he was talking about this particular area. And he said, you see the three lights that are out there in the water? You know, one was here and then one there and one over there. He said, well, when the ships come in to dock here, he said, the, there's a, a buildup of like rock underneath and all around. It gets shallow in this particular area. But there is, if, if you come in and you see these lights and you don't understand why they're there, you might just try to get in and you'll, you'll you know, crush the hull of your ship. And he said, so what they do is they go out and they get where all three lights are lined up perfectly. And then they go in on the right side, and everything will be fine then. And uh, when he said that, I proceeded to tell him about my three lights, and the will of God, the spirit in which it's done, and the timing of God. <clears throat> um, I'll, just say, I'll just say it in the form of a question then. Is it possible that we just you know, we just grab hold of something. And, you know, I mean, it's important to know it is the will of God instead of your will that you call the will of God. I just want what you want. So that there's the right spirit right there. You have to have that spirit or you're just going to do your stuff and you're going to make your ministry or your thing or whatever in your own image after your likeness. <clears throat> and then... You know, where then you end up shipwrecked, crushed, crushed hull. Um, and then verse uh, 27. Um, make sure I've got it all. And he said unto him, thy, this is the servant talking. And he said unto him, thy, fa thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. Thy father, the elder son, has asked for accurate information. Okay, well, here's another little lesson we can get right here. He's asked for accurate information from a servant. And he says, what's going on? And he says, the father has fit, killed the fatted calf. Now, did the father, did, was the fatted calf killed? Yes. Okay, but he says, because, and I've got it all capital, in my thing, because he hath received him safe and sound. The servant's belief in the motive of the father was he's just happy because he, his son is safe and sound. So he's got a prodigal son that's safe. 
meaning he's still a prodigal. Even if he's come back, he's still capable of doing whatever he wants to do. All he's done is repent and say, I'm sorry. Okay, are you changed? No. Okay, so, um, so the servant says, he's, this fatted calf was killed. This offering um, was n nothing more than he wants us safe. He wants his family safe. He wants Christians safe and sound. Um, well, you say, well, isn't that true? Well, not according to the story. That's not what the story is about. You know, and I think, uh, I, I think that it's okay to understand that, but I don't think that's what we preach. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. And so he's, uh, he is misrepresenting the Father. Probably well-meaning, probably trying to convey to the elder son, since he's not in the know and the servant seems to be in the know, because I know that the, he came back, the father killed a fatted calf, now the father's happy. So this has got to be the deal. And we know that the father killed that fatted calf, treated it like a sacrifice and an offering. Um, and let me just say this. When the prodigal came back, something needed to die. There needed to be a death. There needed to be a death. I, you know, it doesn't matter how much and how long I preach that, I still wonder how much people really recognize that I don't care. Only, only this life, this Jesus, this son, comes out of death. It's the only one. And there needs to be that or it's still going to be us. And it's going to be us at our best and man at his best is altogether vanity and and we're, we want, you know, I mean, I mean, I know, you know, I know what it's like to have a deep down desire to want what God wants or what a lot of people do is they don't say want what God wants, but I want to do the will of God, which think about the difference between the wording want what he wants and I want to do the will of God. I just want to be in the will of God. I want to do the will of God. Well, the, even that term, the will of God, really isn't saying what he wants. I mean, the way that we formed it in Christianity, it's saying that in itself is some sort of entity. There's just a general will of God that doesn't necessarily include his heart, that doesn't really find the Lord in a precious way. It can stand back and just say, well, I want the will of God, you know. And, you know, you can want that all you want. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, an example I thought of years ago was, you know, a girl can walk by a, a, a store window and they're hanging on this mannequin is this beautiful dress and she can, she can walk by every day and go, oh, I want that dress. You know, I want it. Oh, and then go on and the next day go and bow on the way to work or back. Or, oh, I really, really want that, you know. But... You know, it's going to cost you. <laughs> you. Want, you know, isn't doesn't really count for anything unless you you get the thing that you're after, and particularly in relationship to the Lord. Um, it's not wanting some general will of God. It is specific to God. It is specific to the Father. It is specific to Jesus. Um, it would be a little bit like my wife come to me and say, I really want what you want. And that's where my heart is, you know. And that's what, that's, you know, I have my own thoughts, but I want to be with you. What, what is it in this area that you want? Or what, you see what I'm saying? And that's, that's stepping out of yourself. That's that's taking a back seat to your wants. And, and let me tell you, many times to want what he wants will override what we want. I mean, it just does. It's just the way that it works. And, 
not without purpose. It is done with purpose. It is done to, can I say it like this, to take our temperature. To take our temperature. God takes our temperature on a regular basis. And he, he does it by sending things your way. I mean, uh, as when I was first really going after seeking the revelation of Christ, which I believe is an ongoing thing and still should be, but when I was doing that, I, I mean, I would, um, you know, I would uh, get to a place where, man, I've really been in the Word, and this is real easy to do. I've been in the Word for a period of time, and you, you'd never say this in your mind, but I'm sick of it. I need to get up and go do something. And God's waiting periods are way longer than ours, especially in this modern day, you know, with the, what do you call it, 80 a.m.? <laughs> Bad case of Adam there, buddy. Because <laughs> we don't, you know, we're, we're wanting something, but we say, I want what you want. But we don't get it. We don't wait for it. We don't suffer if necessary, you know, and go, I, I'm sorry, I am, I mean, that's how new creation began, with just a small group of people on our knees saying, we are not going to get up, we are not going to start a church, we are not going to do, we want to see Jesus and we want to be changed. Well, in my early days before that, I would go, oh, this is it, surely this is it, and I would jump up, and I'm ready to, yeah, I got it, only to have the Lord put something else in my path that would show me, you really don't have it, buddy. And there are people, I'm just being honest with you, there are people who do not want to be confronted with where they're at. They do not want to know that they're not all that God would ever want. And they get upset when you push them a little bit, you know. You, you remember the uh, Esther sharing about soaking and soaking? Well, I quit on sharing on that because some people didn't want to soak. Well, they wanted me to go soak my head, but that was, you know. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, there's a drive that has to be in us for the Lord. There, I mean, a real drive, and especially in transition times, especially at that, you know, you've heard me talk about it. If these two were separated from here and there, you know, you're, God is transitioning you over to this one, and you, you have to let go of this one before you even reach that one. It's, it's a little off balance, and you don't know which way to go, and, you know, should I go back or forward and it just it, it's uh, scary in a certain sense but it's all meant to test and the word test doesn't mean to tempt you to failure it means uh, and this is a good little search if you ever want to do it there's two different Greek words used in the New Testament for one is for test and one is for tempt. And if you looked up the word test, and sometimes the translator, I don't know why, they actually used, not very often, but they would switch it and use another word. But if you look it up in the Greek, it's faithful to its meaning. If he tests you, it is a test with every hope and belief that you will be with him. You will be found as pure gold. But tempting is the devil tempts you with the exact reason is to make you fail. See. So anyway, that's a good little search, and it also can help you look into the heart of the Father a little more um, and realize that he's for you, but he's for his son more than he's for you. Yeah. You know, He's not just trying to make your life safe and sound. <laughs> he's not. He is trying to bring forth his son out of you, and that's not going to happen with, uh, you know, living in a bed of roses. And I'm looking at some of you, and you're going, well, I ain't living there, so I know that I'm, you know, I know that uh, God can do it. So trust the Lord, amen? All right, let's take a little break. <laughs> 